Ja, men det är Falter Overstank. Good day, Radio Maria Era. Nice to have your company here, as always, 11.15-ish for our chatty cases. It's the Wednesday, the 18th of May. And as always, it's great to be with you. Father Eamon McCarthy is my name, if you're new to Radio Maria Ireland. And I'm the priest director here with the last five years or so. And it's just lovely to see the growth and the movement forward all the time of Radio Maria Ireland. Thanks to you and all our dear listeners and friends. And a big, huge thank you once again for the lovely correspondence that's coming in this week, still flowing in the door in the light of our Mariathon last week and how many of you very much enjoy the variety of programming and the um, just the enthusiasm and the zeal and the um, sense of spirit of solidarity with the world family of Radio Maria in our mission of reaching the ends of the earth. And... Uh, with Our Lady, of course, as uh, radio stations all over the world. So uh, helping, no doubt, and I have um, no hesitation to uh, believe that we are assisting in the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary in our own gentle way, one of many great initiatives and missions uh, being, I suppose, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this Pentecost time or this uh, Easter time looking to Pentecost. And in the church throughout the world, there's a lot of beautiful ministries coming to light. The Holy Spirit is ever creative and renewing the face of the earth all the while. And Radio Maria is simply one of those great uh, movements of our day that we can see the hand of God very much at work. And so thank you again and may God bless all of you who so kindly pray with us and pray for us, who help promote and encourage the growth of the radio here and all indeed who assist us financially. We're very much indebted to you and be assured of a daily place in our prayers and indeed a reward in this life and in the life to come for your kindness and generosity. So we have since exceeded our target of €30,000, which is what we set for us uh, based on previous years. Perhaps we should have added a little bit more, I don't know, but we've certainly gone past it and uh, we'll give you a final answer to that maybe the end of this week or next week just so that we allow the final correspondence to flow in and uh, those offerings which uh, you had meant to make, pledged, let's say, and uh, are still in the process of making, if you like. I can understand how these things can take a little bit of time to get organised and so on to get to the post office or get to the bank or I don't get a stamp, all of these things. So thank you so much. God bless you all. Uh, Ulrika was in touch again to just give us a roundup of the Mariathon in Radio Horeb in Germany. Our good friends over there who again have so kindly made it possible for us to keep going here. Uh, we have since uh, moved across from Radio Horeb to the world family of Radio Maria. And they too have since said, look, we're cutting the apron sp sp uh, strings a little bit and uh, over to you. Uh, figure it out yourselves and you, you know the drill. We're able to let you work away more or less independently uh, to try to make ends meet. So we're still at that task, even ourselves, in, in growing all the, all the uh, growing to the point where we can be self-sufficient. But in the meantime, the Mariathon, of course, is for those radios that haven't a hope and uh, need some dig out and help along as we ourselves, as I say, we've received. But in Radio Horeb, uh, they reach three, the three million mark and uh, we'll keep an ear to the ground there as well. I'm sure Ulrika will keep us informed as well that there tends to be a little um, uh, after wave, you know, kind of tsunami really of great generosity. And then another little smaller tsunami comes in uh, of those who follow through on pledges made. Uh, and that's lovely to see. So they may well exceed, well exceed their three million mark. Uh, so last year, they, of course, they raised four million. And they're mindful, as we indeed are mindful just of the, the, the stretch that's being put upon us with inflation and growing prices in relation to all kinds of things. Uh, fuel, of course, uh, which will have a knock on effect on everything else as a result, too. And uh, this we're experiencing, certainly. And it means that those who are so generous are indeed extra generous uh, in many ways, too. So again, many, many thanks. We're just so grateful. It's a great source of affirmation. And like yesterday's lovely reading from the Acts of the Apostles, puts fresh heart into the believers. And we hope too that by our work and mission here every day, we are seeking to put fresh heart into your spiritual life, your faith life, in the living out of the gospel as we all seek to do, even in the face of difficulties and trials, hardships and challenges and worries and concerns and 
all of these things. There is no one who doesn't have a share in some way in the cross. So uh, such is, is the nature of our mission to accompany you on that path and to be your friend, to be your companion on the way, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus journeying, and they recognize Jesus at the breaking of bread and it utterly transforms and changes their journey from one of being downcast and you know surely you've heard about all the things that have been going on in Jerusalem well what things and instead of you know downcast and walking away from it all they return back into the whole melee and and get stuck in with uh, building the church just like St. Paul actually yesterday is reading too the very same you know that Paul and Barnabas they 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 took some pretty serious hits there for their preaching of the gospel. Paul was stoned and they thought he was dead. They dragged him out of the, the village and just left him there. And yet he pops up and what does he do? Turns and he goes back into the, the place where they, they had stoned him. They must have just completely floored them uh, to see him back in and preaching. Most, most uh, extraordinary work of the Spirit. And to this day, the Spirit continues in the very same way. So... Uh, again, may God bless you all, and uh, we are here certainly at your service, and so glad indeed to be in fellowship with you and offering indeed the life-giving grace of the Word of God made flesh, the great stories and testimonies of so many saints, and indeed of our great listeners coming in to share some of their stories with us too, and building it up and, and growing as a community all the time. So thanks for that. I hope you were listening in to uh, Father Billy Swan this morning. He was uh, speaking about uh, St. Charles de Foucault, uh, an extraordinary saint. And he was canonized, of course, uh, this past Sunday and uh, others along with him. A French missionary and an extraordinary life and charism that he had and set up his own spiritual family, really, of Charles de Foucault. And the Pope describes him as a prophet for our times who knew how to highlight the essence and universality of the faith. And he had a very ecumenical spirit and bringing people together, certainly in seeking to reach out. And Jesus Caritas, of course, is the movement associated with St. Charles de Foucault. And Jesus love, Caritas meaning charity, which is the highest form of love. And he discovered that truth by returning to Jesus' hidden life at Nazareth as he lived in Jesus' hometown for several years. And the Pope said, I encourage you, like Brother Charles, to continue to envision Jesus walking in the midst of people, patiently carrying out a difficult job and living day to day in a family and a city. So a gentle presence would be maybe a good way to understand that. And that we do well to imitate that and seek to be a gentle presence to others in our own homes and families too. So the Pope said on Sunday that it must please the Lord to see men and women who imitate St. Charles along this path of littleness, humility and solidarity with the poor. Of course, Pope Francis is trying to do the very same himself. Uh, St. Charles discovered the essence of the faith, which uh, he wrote was... God gives a primacy of place to love and then to sacrifice inspired by love and obedience derived from love. So the Pope urging us to imitate him. So it was in the uh, 15 years that St. Charles of Foucault spent in the Sahara Desert of Algeria and ministering to the poor there and the Muslim community particularly and sadly, his life was taken by, by bandits there in the early 1900s and um, effectively, I suppose, a, a martyr for the faith in his own way. Um, and he went there not with the specific objective of converting others, but only of living in the gratuitous love of God, carrying out an apostolate of goodness. And it's the case that certainly if we live the faith in that way and we share it in that way, it cannot but overflow to others. It cannot but uh, see us being used as a channel of grace to others. Uh, God will do that. And in, in all kinds of hidden ways and hidden to ourselves, and the Lord allows that too, 
so that we don't become proud or puffed up or think, well, aren't I doing a great job? And look at all this, the fruits of everything that I'm doing here. The Lord doesn't, uh, it's, it's very often it's done in secret and, and done unbeknownst to us that, that God's grace works in that way. So he sought, St. Charles, to have Christians and Muslims and Jews and idolaters alike, I suppose non-believers, to consider him their brother by opening the doors of his house to all people. So a kind of universal charity was at work there. And uh, he said, you know, it's a great example, especially in a time like ours in which we, we risk closing ourselves off or increasing distances or losing sight of our brothers and sisters. And th th there's new kind of obstacles in the way of that, the likes of uh, social media and the internet. Now we, we kind of have maybe at times more distant type relationships with one another. Now, while it's good and, and useful, certainly these things are great tools and instruments, you can see it's bringing us closer together as a community in the radio. And I think that's marvelous use of the gift. And hopefully that's a step then to bring us closer to one another in reality and in person after the model, say, of St. Charles de Foucault, uh, that we can see the need and the call to reach out in person to one another, too. Um, even if it isn't always, I suppose, the, 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 the physical contact may not be possible, of course, for some, but in our hearts, a bit like St. Therese of Lisieux, isn't it, that she was a patroness of the missions, but she never set foot outside the convent. But there was a closeness in her heart, in, in the love she, she bore for those around her, which overflowed into the, the mission that she is now patroness of. So even Pope Francis saying himself that uh, St. Charles de Foucault's spiritual, uh, spirituality helped him personally when he was studying theology. He must have come across Jesus Caritas at that time. I remember it being active in the seminary um, in my own day in Maynooth and helping a lot of uh, my fellow seminarians too. The Pope says, he helped me overcome my crises and find a more simple, less Pelagian path of Christian life, which is closer to God. This was Pelagian. I don't know the exact context of his heresy, but maybe the Pope was leaning a bit too much uh, towards the, the spiritual rather than the practical. Maybe that's what he's meaning there. Um, and we see, indeed, he is a Pope of the poor, and he just loves that contact with the poor, very direct and very um, personal and personable too. So the Pope concluded his speech by inviting the group to focus on St. Charles de Foucault's joy, because joy is the purest witness that we can offer to Jesus in every place and time. And the joy of the gospel, of course, the joy of believing in Christ and being believers, the joy of the Holy Spirit, one of those uh, gifts, fruits of the Holy Spirit that comes when we are at peace with the Lord and knowing that our destiny is Him and communion with Him. And that helps us then to overcome and, and uh, live with our own weaknesses and shortcomings. And I'm sure St. Charles of Foucault heading off into desert regions like that, you know, it, it pairs everything back and it's a way of coming to realize how poor we really are and how completely dependent on God we are. And this is where the grace of the sacraments and especially of confession enter in to help us reveal ourselves to ourselves by God's grace and to see how much we are in need of God's grace constantly. We simply can't do this. It's not possible to live the spiritual life without an abundance of God's grace uh, to, to help us along. So that's great that we have these new saints, St. Charles de Foucault, pray for us, uh, another saint to add into our litany and another friend in eternity to get to know and to uh, hear more about. We must uh, indeed put it on our dream sheet. We have such a long wallpaper list uh, of uh, wonderful plans and ideas for the radio here, things to share with you, but um, to introduce maybe you, if you haven't heard it before, to Jesus Caritas and maybe get some of those who are involved in that uh, wonderful apostolate and mission and spirituality to come and share with us. It's a nice invitation perhaps for us to do that as well. So that's something we'll put on our list 
uh, to do and I'm sure a lady will send us in somebody suited to that. Now, very good. If you're free on the 4th of June, uh, the All-Ireland Rosary Rally uh, will be visiting Knock from half past one in Knock Shrine. And I know there are buses going from all over the country. And uh, do get in touch with Father Marius O'Reilly and Fiona's number is there as well for the All-Ireland Rosary Rally. Uh, we can give you the details there, but by all means, look it up online as well. All Ireland Rosary Rally, Saturday, June the 24th. And there will be talks, of course, Stations of the Cross, the Rosary and Holy Mass. The main celebrant will be Archbishop Jude Thaddeus O'Colo, whom we had the great privilege of having with us here uh, Friday. Um, last Friday, it was the 13th. Uh, has not watching the time there. And Bishop Michael Dignan uh, will be celebrating too. He's the new... A joint bishop, I don't know what uh, what title, or the bishop of two dioceses, maybe joint bishop isn't the right word, double bishop, I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, newly um, installed bishop of Galway and Kilfenora, Kilmacdua, and also the uh, bishop of the neighbouring diocese as well, um, of Clonfert. So he'll be there uh, preaching. And uh, Father Marius will give a little rosary talk to the bold Father Marius, who's our good friend here, and of course, uh, commits himself so much to the breakfast show on a Thursday morning and the Rosary Stories show on a Thursday evening here. So we can give you the contact details, leave it to you to look that up online for yourself and you might like to, or maybe I'll just call out the number if you have a pen and paper handy and you want to go to the All-Ireland Rosary Rally on June the 4th, uh, by all means do at that. So Fiona's number 086 086 876 Eight seven six zero zero five eight oh eight six eight seven six zero zero five eight and give Fiona a call uh, if you can organise a bus and uh, you can find out more details there as well. Our own trip to Knock is coming up next Tuesday. It's coming up upon us very quickly and our bus is full. Uh, we didn't anticipate this. I must chat with Ruth and see. I, I, I met uh, Ken last night. Ken is um, helping to organise that bus too. And Mary Fitzpatrick, our own Mary Fitz. So um, I wonder if there's a, a sufficient of an overflow with a second bus be organised. I must ask that question and see would that be possible. Because Ken was telling me last night there are um, there's a waiting list, in fact, if there are one or two dropping out. And there's one lady I saw sent in an email there. She had to drop out. She uh, Getting transport uh, was difficult uh, home for her, I think, after the trip. So she said she wouldn't take a chance and would join us maybe on another time. So it may be, and it does happen, that people have to drop out for one reason or another. So I know there's a short list there of those who are coming on our bus from Dublin here from the Red Cow Lewis stop at quarter to eight on next Tuesday morning. I'll be travelling, of course, myself. And it'll be a lovely trip, please God. And we pray for fine weather on the day too. And it'll be our own first Radio Maria pilgrimage to Knock. That'll be next Tuesday. And we'll share with you all the excitement of that. And maybe try to connect in with you maybe from Knock as well. It might be nice if we can feature that. We'll see if we can get that organised too. It might be nice to do a little live link. So this is the season and thank God indeed for the great blessing of being able to get out and about and lots of things being organised and great events happening all the time too. So our trip to Knock next Tuesday as well. So we'll keep the momentum going throughout the summer as best we can indeed and involve you as listeners. I know indeed a number of you would love to come and for one reason or another unable to do so but will journey with us in spirit and if other things being equal, I know you would, you would certainly come along too. But um, we will carry you with us and we'll share the journey a little bit with you too and uh, bring you to knock spiritually like that. And indeed, we do hope to meet uh, many of you who will be able to make your own way to knock, perhaps uh, on, by your own means. And uh, we'll meet at the adoration, uh, the apparition chapel, please God, at half past twelve for Holy Mass on Tuesday next at Knock Shrine. So if you're able to come and make your own way there, do come along and meet us there. If it is that the numbers uh, exceed the capacity of the Apparition Chapel, then we may well have to revert to the parish church. And that would be a nice blessing too. And maybe as we go along, again, we have ambitions to make it a regular trip and an even bigger trip. And uh, that we would love to do. 
and uh, maybe we can join forces i don't know with with a group or other uh, in in years to come and make it a, a much make it much bigger event and find our way to the basilica as well that would be absolutely fabulous so very good uh, fabulous to see all this great zeal and this great enthusiasm for the faith and how much it is really needed nowadays we see some of the headlines which Oh gosh, can 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 be a little bit uh, upsetting and disturbing. For my part, I, I tend to stay away from secular media sources. I get the worst of it from people who come to tell me about it, and <laughs> that's enough. That's enough, really. Um, and we see, sadly, indeed, just the, the sort of rejection of of faith at times. So a small number, but a vocal number, turning away from the the great heritage and blessing the gift that is our faith, and that's very sad to see. Uh, we know and we've been around the country enough now too to know there are many wonderful wonderful people of great faith and great zeal still whose voices can't be heard and won't be heard in in the secular side of things and maybe be that as it may um there's a sense in which you know if you think it through uh, that those sort of s secular voices that are tend to be so negative and tend to be in opposition of all that is good, how can they survive? That That's uh, from sacred scripture. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. So when you have secular voices who are advocating, you know, the destruction of life in the womb, who are advocating a form of what they call marriage that isn't fruitful, and it can't be fruitful, again, how, how can, again, the vine and the, and the branches and the, See, apart from Christ, we, we can do nothing. It, it just won't bear fruit. And if it bears any fruit, it'll be bad fruit. And that can simply, by all just logic and reason alone, whatever about, you know, what faith teaches us, that simply cannot last. It just, it's impossible for it to last. It, it's in self-destruct mode, and very sadly so. And we, we lament to see it so that there are those who would draw that path of hedonism, of selfishness, of the world, of the flesh and the devil we were speaking about yesterday, and continue on that path blindly to see that it's a complete dead end. It ends up in, you know, destruction, doom, really. Where, where is life and how can there be life in that? So we see it happening, we lament it, and we pray on behalf of our dear brothers and sisters who are so lost and turning towards the darkness. And again, how, how, how tragic that is. And wouldn't it be so much the better if indeed all sources of media would welcome Christ the light, welcome the gift of faith and the blessings and peace that it brings and the life that accompanies it instead of the, the, these dark voices uh, you know, working against the light, working against Christ, working against his faithful. Um, my image always, you know what it is, it feels like you know, there are those who want to push the church off the west of Ireland, you know, push it <laughs> over the cliffs of Moher and, and just have done with it. Um, no, 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 that's that's completely wrong. It, 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 it's, it's a denial. You see, it's, it's a very much pitched in, in a way that uh, denies all the tremendous good that has been done by the church in education, in health care, in, in comfort and consolation and ministry to many souls in great need, in the great missionary endeavor, indeed, of bringing that light of that gospel to other places impoverished in so many ways. Um, it's, it's somehow that all of that has to be denied or obfuscated or ignored or simply not even referred to. And whatever is negative and whatever is, you know, the sins of, of those, um, again, who, who should know better. And, and you know, it's, it's in a way it's right that those sins should be made public and we should be very much open and accountable and confess and ask, ask forgiveness and seek to make amends. All that is necessary and true, but balance it with all the great good that still continues to this day and the huge blessings that are pouring into communities, into families, into homes, and the faith that is still very much there. <coughs> and, 
excuse me. So let's not get kind of sucked into that, that darkness, that mode of sort of critical uh, self-destruction. But let's uh, work, roll the sleeves up and, and work at the good, see the good, involve ourselves in it, and seek to be like St. Charles de Foucault in, in a sort of alien and hostile environment to be a, a presence of joy, to give hope and light to people who are on that path of darkness, even though they don't realize maybe many that they're on that path of self-destruction and of darkness and of turning away from the light. If we can somehow be a small little flicker of light to them, that might attract them back or turn them around or see, look, there's a better way. There, there's a path that offers hope and, and peace and reconciliation and, and light and welcome and community. And it's life giving and life affirming. And, and again, it offers hope into the future. Uh, we, we have to see ourselves in that way. <clears throat> and again, the model as always, Our Lady at the foot of the cross, things couldn't have been more bleak or more, you know, at a, at a sense of utter loss. I mean, even the Lord's own prayer, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It seems as if even that prayer was being unanswered at the time. And yet it was the cry of the, the Lord on behalf of those who have been forsaken, who feel forsaken or who feel, um, or again, who've gone down that path and have lost all hope that in that cry and through that cry of Christ from the cross and Our Lady must have felt that cry it must have flowed out of her heart too and perhaps here was some moment of light and hope and love for the Lord from the cross that if it was that his spirit crying out this deep prayer the first line of the 21st Psalm that um, here was Our Lady she had not forsaken him she was there with him. She must have surely uh, reached out to, to touch him maybe at that point to communicate in some way, look, she was there too in that forsakenness. So we seek to be that. That's what we seek to be in a world that <coughs> somehow has, has forsaken God. <coughs> Excuse me, it's not God has forsaken us. How many of us sadly have, have forsaken God? And that's not a happy ending. Uh, except that we, we turn and, and come back to him. So there's our challenge, and here's what we're living up to, and I know indeed uh, we are effectively engaged in right now, at this very moment, and uh, touching souls and reaching out to them. So let's pause for a little piece of music, if I may, and uh, thank you again for being part of Radio Maria. And as always, please do connect in, please do uh, touch in with us as well. Uh, the numbers, as always, 0894672000 to text and WhatsApp us here, plus 353894672000. And Margaret is kindly volunteering downstairs to answer the phones, 0141234560, 0141234560. So give a call here. And again, if you like to put pen to paper, you'd like to drop us a line, a note, we would gratefully receive that too. We're at St. Anthony's Business Park, Ballymount Road, Dublin 22. Now, Kathleen left a, vo a voice message requesting a song for us. So, uh, by all means, Kathleen, we get requests into us from time to time too. If you'd like to send in a music request and fit them in as best we can, she wanted bind us together. Lord, a nice little piece of music there. So, Shane will put that in for us now, and we'll be back very shortly.
Shadow Keys is back in. That's a lovely uh, version of Bind Us Together, indeed. So that's for Kathleen. Thanks for texting in and asking for that little piece of music there. If you'd like a piece of music played, uh, let us know. Uh, it's not always that we can play it uh, in quick response uh, to your request, uh, given that we do a lot more talking than we do playing of music. But the music shows, usually at lunchtime, is a, is a good time to be able to do that. Our Dominic McGorian's show is a nice one, too. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock is a good time to ask for a request and a piece of music there, too. Pope John the first is the feast day today. Um, he was Tuscan by birth, joined the clergy of Rome and held the important office of archdeacon. Uh, there is such a, an office nowadays of archdeacon, but I think these are like canons and monsignors and that sort of thing. They're honorific titles, I think, more than anything else, rather than that of a particular office, let's say, or ministry in the church. Uh, at any rate, he was a friend and confidant of Boethius, great philosopher, uh, in the year 523. So we're going way back uh, into the first half of the last millennium. Uh, he was chosen bishop of Rome in succession to Hormizdas in spite of advanced years and failing health. And his short episcopate was mainly filled by the embassy which the Arian emperor Theodoric the Goth compelled him to make to uh, Byzantium. Uh, There's a load of history in that sentence. (laughs) The object of this was to obtain toleration for the Arians in the East. If he failed, there would be reprisals against the Orthodox Catholics in the West. And Pope John was received with immense enthusiasm and respect by the Greeks, but obtained only minor concessions from the Eastern Emperor. When he returned to Ravenna, then Theodoric's capital, he was imprisoned because Theodoric suspected him of betrayal and of siding with the Eastern Emperor against him. So the poor man, he couldn't win either which way he he went. It's often the case with with great saints. They are misunderstood at times. Um, At any rate, he was responsible for introducing to the West the Alexandrian calculation of Easter. Way back, 6th century there, Pope John I. It's his uh, optional memorial day today. And isn't that the task of, of popes indeed? They, they stand between heaven and earth. They stand between races and nations and they engage with the the strife and the troubles of the time. And the pope was uh, anxious to get that message over to uh, the young people of a, a group called Chemin Neuf, Shema means way, and Nuf means nine, ninth way. I'm not sure of the origin of the name, Shema Nuf community, and to encourage them in the way of political fraternity, you know, to engage with the world of politics, uh, to encounter reflection and action, and that uh, we as followers of Christ have a part to play in bringing the light of the gospel to bear into the political realm. Uh, interesting little letter from Brendan O'Regan. Somebody sent it to me, a pro-life letter. The, by the way, the rallies for life are coming up uh, very soon. I think if they have not already started, they're starting this weekend uh, all around Ireland. And we must share more on that with you. They're great public demonstrations of support for life in the womb. Very important that we do so uh, peacefully, of course, uh, but with in numbers to make our presence felt that we respect the sanctity of human life and seek to uphold it. And this is over the years, many years now, is it 50 years since 1973, that uh, the Roe v. Wade decision was made by the Supreme Court in the US and it became federal law that abortion was legalized in the United States. And recently a document was leaked to suggest that the Supreme Court are going to reverse that decision. And of course, those who are against life and want the destruction of unborn life up in arms saying that here we have the small group of conservative thinkers uh, imposing their will upon the people and so on and so forth. And yet uh, Brendan Regan made a very valid point Look, you can't have it both ways. You know, it was all well and good back in 1973 when a small group of, you know, Supreme Court judges decided to legalize abortion. And that was okay because you wanted that decision. But now that it's being reversed, it's not okay. So you you can't have your cake and eat it. And in fact, what seems to be taking place is that the federal system, which would be that governing the whole of the United States, is sort of devolving the question to, to state governance that states themselves can 
vote and can you know the 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 elected representatives can then uh, do the will of the people uh, in each of the respective states and we see some uh, wonderful pro-life laws in places like Texas and other southern states where they're seeking to really protect the sanctity of life in the womb and that whole tsunami of deaths you know they're trying to to row all that back uh, by one small victory after another and exposing the truth about this awful heinous destruction of life and abuse of children and, and mothers and that we can surely offer something far far better to mothers who are with child than the destruction of that unborn life so our rallies for life in Ireland will be taking place coming up very soon uh, we'll give you more details on that too please God and uh, see if we can get somebody in to speak to us about that and encourage you to attend and, and show your presence. But as we know and as we have learned and as we see is absolutely essential and core is not just the political engagement that the Pope is certainly encouraging Shaman Nuff there to, um, he said first and foremost, he said politics is an art of encounter. So it's not just in the demonstrations. Uh, these have their place. And it's good that we sort of publicly stand for what is right and good and wholesome. But in, in politics, encounter means engaging with those of who disagree with us. Um, and that's what the Pope was saying to them. Uh, I think it was yes, uh, well, maybe it was at the weekend he met them. Uh, dialogue, he says to them, especially with those who disagree with you. So uh, th this is where the, uh, politics, I suppose, comes into its own. It's, it's meant, you're meant to have an opposition party. You're meant to have a kind of holding to account. They are, after all, our, our representatives whom we have elected and whom our taxes support and pay their pensions and everything else that, that they enjoy. And for the most part, I know our politi pol political representatives do great good at the, at the civic level, and we expect them to, to do so. That's the reason they are uh, where they are. Um, but uh, likewise, too, uh, we in the encounter and in the dialogue, we want to see the truth prevail. And we want to see the preservation and sanctity of human life above all in its most vulnerable stages to be safeguarded so that we can build trust that all the other issues that surround life and its value and its good likewise regarded and upheld. It's not unreasonable. That's surely a very reasonable approach. And so if it is that there is care for the poor and for the migrants, there is concern for the unemployed, for the sick, again for those in prison, uh, all these are duties of the state, education of our, our youth, um, all grave matters indeed, enforcing and keeping the peace, all just terrific parts of uh, what it is to be a state and living in communion and working towards the common good, then uh, that which serves that good and not just the latest in either political correctness or the latest in freedom of expression or the latest in equality for the sake of equality. You need to be, again, this is where the dialogue comes in. What does it mean to be politically correct? What does it mean to strive towards equality? What does it mean, again, to uh, embrace some of the, the, the modern ideas of our day? This is the art of politics and I'm no politician and have no aspirations in that direction whatsoever. But if they come to my front door, I will happily engage with them. And I've had politicians challenge me, TDs challenge me at my front door as a priest, and inevitably they'll, they'll come. And my question is, and it's a fundamental one for me, that if there is an openness to the sanctity of life in the womb, uh, that is a foundation on which all the other issues can be built upon and work around. Not that it's just a singular issue alone, but th this is a litmus test, at least for me at any rate. Um, and it seems to me that that holds good because if we can uh, respect life at its most vulnerable, then when it's not so vulnerable, again, in, again the other issues that concern us, all these things will, will flow together and make, make sense. So uh, the Pope speaks of trying to um, work towards unity, a change of heart, and that politics not become a violent confrontation, 
where people try to impose their own ideas or pursue particular interests over the common good. So, um, so it's a case of not entering into conflict so much as working, grappling with issues in order to come to the, the fullness of truth and not to sway with the latest in opinions or in, in beliefs or fashions or fashionable ideas. Quite the challenge, quite the challenge. So uh, we have to s- stand up and, and confront some of the ideologies and some of the foolish thinking that can present itself and say, no, that, that's not right, that makes no sense. But engage, as the Pope says, in some kind of encounter to very challenging stuff, very challenging. We'll come back to this conversation, of course, and others in future chat. He says, so thank you for your company today. It's approaching 12 o'clock. May God bless you all. Do please stay tuned here. We're going to fade away from the camera now, but we'll listen to our bells and pray together our Regina Celli and Midday Prayer. <laughs>